Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 31st. Hope everybody had a nice, happy Halloween. We didn't have as many trick-or-treaters as normal because it was very rainy outside. I think we got 35. We normally have something like 200, but hey, the ones that got out there got the candy. This first article was from Bob, 1954 Shadow, and I actually got this confused with a second article at the same time. I did not notice, but there's two different articles about space junk, and as usual, uh, well, let's let me just tell you the first piece of space junk that uh, Bob sent in the article about that is called is from motherboard is called an alien artifact is going to pass earth in 2017 and the article i thought he was referring to that i had read just a little bit before that was from gizmodo mysterious chunk of space trash is on a collision course with earth this is a piece of space junk that's actually going to burn up in our atmosphere or if it doesn't burn up all the way it's going to crash into the ocean just a little bit south of sri lanka but the main thing with this is I'm kind of interested about the fact that uh, scientists, um, be, just being scientists, what you do when you spot something in the sky, and this one was uh, spotted by the one that's going to pass Earth in 2017, was uh, spotted by James Scott working at the University of Arizona's Kitt Peak Observatory. Well, what you want to do as a scientist is you want to not assume it's anything when you first see an object in the sky. You want to write down all the possibilities, including even the wild, far-off ones, like it could possibly be even a piece of uh, space uh, alien technology or something like that and as a matter of fact another astronomer in the uh, University of Adelaide named Duncan Steele he was tracking the object too and he happened to write down all of the possibilities that this object could be including he wrote down the possibility it could be alien in origin he doesn't himself think that that's very likely but he wrote that down as a possibility so what does the news media do they you know they glom onto that part and forget all the rest of the parts if you remember last week they also had a bunch of articles too about the astronomers had found a disk around the an ancient um, or a faraway star they'd found a disk formation that was behaving a little bit strangely the way it was bending the light and things like that and they took it all the way from being a dust disk around the star to being some alien technology building a Dyson sphere and maybe a big huge um, you know metropolitan you know metropolis type of a deal with uh, you know all kinds of civilizations living there and technology and crap they just take these weird things and just make them into totally ridiculous um, wild theories is what I'm saying so anyway getting back to what this is this one's going to pass in 2017 and it is most likely what they think is a piece of the Apollo a piece of junk left over from one of the Apollo missions and also the one that's going to hit in November 13th and it's called object WT 1190F which is going to burn up in orbit around 619 GMT and any remaining fragments will splash into the Indian Ocean just south of Sri Lanka that they also think is something from one of the um, rockets of the Apollo era maybe could be a panel could be a lot of things when you have a, a rocket traveling at that kind of velocity from Earth to be intercepted into moon orbit and along the way you open panels you eject stages you uh, eject bags of waste and stuff like that it's going to take up some kind of orbit if it doesn't end up crashing into the moon or the earth it's going to take up some kind of orbit and uh, either be uh, ejected from the moon's orbit out into outer space or the earth's orbit eventually or it's going to take up some kind of uh, elliptical or figure eight orbit or something like that it's going to go somewhere with all the pieces we have i am sure over the next uh, decade hundred years we're still gonna see more and more of it coming back to uh, visit us again there's a lot of space junk up there but anyway I just thought that was kinda interesting that the uh, first thing the news media always gloms onto is oh it's an alien space probe coming to examine us uh, I, I think there may be possibility there may be ancient artifacts out there if there are other advanced civilizations but if it's clear to the other side of the galaxy or even several hundred light years away uh, the chances of us ever actually seeing it anywhere near the Earth-Moon system are pretty much zero, at least in my opinion. And let's see, this next one was sent to me by Calm Biker. This is from BBC News. Tractor beam grabs beads with sound waves. Right now they're just using these sound waves to control little 5 millimeter beads. But the interesting thing about it is they're doing it in a different way. They're uh, not surrounding these objects with sound. They're only doing it from one particular location. The secret to a tractor beam is being able to actually take an object. Like, say, if you want a tractor beam like uh, Star Trek, 
you want to actually pull up alongside an object, uh, say it be just a asteroid out in outer space or a meteor or a piece, just a big hunk of rock, you want to be able to grab a hold of that with a tractor beam and then bring it closer towards your spaceship or push it away, whatever. And you're not going to be able, in that case, on a spaceship to easily surround it with sound. You're only going to be able to project the sound from one uh, from one direction. Well, they've been able to do it with this in the lab. They've been able to demonstrate it. And what they also did was they turned the whole, first they were like, um, having the sound waves below it, which was kind of like propelling it in an upward direction, and they wanted to see as an experiment, so they turned it around upside down to see if they could actually draw these be beads up into it. That, that to me is kind of what a tractor beam is all about, being able to draw something towards you even if it's against gravity, and they were able to successfully do that. So, uh, Professor Drinkwater is his name, developed a system with collaborators at Bristol Company, Ultra Haptics, as well as the University of Sussex. So if you get a chance to check that out, that is kind of cool. I mean, very small scale. I mean, we're not going to use it for anything big. A little five millimeter plastic bead is not a lot, but it's a good start. You know, first generation is never, you know, exactly um, what it's going to end up to be. And this next one was sent to me by Nick H. And Gary J. And this is just kind of, this one and the next one are just going to be kind of real cool things. It's not necessarily something real new and innovative, but this is Yamaha's robot motorcycle rider could challenge real racers. And if you see a picture of it here, I'll put the picture up. Um, it really does look like a person on top of it. They, they didn't really need to do it that way. I mean, I've seen since the DARPA challenge, even going back more than five years ago, um, you've seen robot driven motorcycles before where they can balance and do all those kind of things, but uh, they just took it upon themselves to build the computer system into the rider and evidently they've got it built so well that they're going to switch it over to different I think it's just at this stage right now that they can switch it over to different Yamaha sports bikes and put this computer shaped like a human being onto the sports bikes and maybe eventually get the technology so well that it can be competitive in racing I don't think at this point the way the description goes here that it is at this very moment but no reason why with enough computer power enough ability to uh, you know, maneuver around and do the right kind of things like as a rider would do that you could not have robot racers actually beating the human ones. And they were talking about is this going to possibly put a end to uh, regular racing with human beings if the robots can beat you all the time? Or will it be a separate sport maybe, robot racing on the motorcycles? Um, I still think the human beings have a, always have a place in sports. I mean, even if we develop sports, they could play football way better than uh, human beings. We're still going to want to watch human beings play football games and other sports to speak of. And this last one, I just happened to be looking around the internet and saw this myself, and it's a it's a rather simple gadget. It's nothing really super innovative other than just modifying an everyday object. It's called a sports brella or a, no sport brella. And it's kind of cool. I'll show you a few pictures of it here. And you can buy them on Amazon for between I think the highest price I found it for is around a hundred bucks, but at one the blue color of this thing they had for around fifty six bucks. And it's just kind of like a lean-to shelter. It's something if you were out in the woods maybe going fishing or camping or hunting if you weren't going to really stay overnight it would just be a nice little shelter against the wind and some light rain. It wouldn't be a place you would want to probably use as a tent and especially you wouldn't want to use it in a real stormy or real windy conditions but you know just for some light drizzle or just to protect you from the sun or whatever I think it makes just a, a nice little pop-up lean-to and uh, yeah, basically you just unfold it like an umbrella, and if you want to, you can put some little tent pegs in the uh, bottom part to hold it in place. But I think it's rather cool. I mean, somebody came up with a really nice, simple idea, and it's even got a, a roll-down window on the side, so you can get a little bit of ventilation and get a little bit of view out the other direction. I think it's rather cool. Uh, also, before I finish my show, I would like to uh, give another chance. He's, he uh, give another shout out. He gives me shout outs all the time for the TDD report, and I forget all the time to give him shout outs. But if you get a chance, check out Muzzle Mike's channel. He does a weekly show, and he's been doing it regular, and knocking him out. It's called In the Lawn or In the Lounge, depending on whether he's indoors or outdoors. And he just uh, came up with one that he just posted a few hours ago called Four Season Writing. I'll put the link down below, but if you get a chance, check out his channel. I like it when just ordinary, everyday people do a weekly show and take it upon themselves week by week to just stick it out and do it. I'm going to be doing it for my ninth season, so TDD Report has been on the air just because of people like you and because people still want to watch it, and I've still got people that like to view it, and I've got friends that help me by sending in articles, and I want to thank you very much for doing that. So at that, I'm going to tell you I will catch you guys next week.